Hello, welcome everyone to a fireside chat to mark the launching of CIL in National, uh, Singapore National Academy of International Law 2021. I'm Asla Korkmaz and this year I will be assisting in the academy. I'm very excited to be a part of this diverse group. I myself am today joining from Serbia, but we have participants from over 63 countries and we're quite excited to hear all their voices throughout the academy. We have with us today Dr. Nilifar Oral from the Director of National University of Singapore's Centre for International Law and Professor Patricia Galvoa Teles, Associate Professor of International Law at the Autonomous University of Lisbon and an adjunct senior researcher at the NUS Centre for International Law. They will be discussing with Professor uh, Jayakumar and Professor Tommy Ko on international lawmaking, climate change, international negotiations, ASEAN, um, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea and third party dispute settlements. Without further ado, we will now begin the fireside chat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Much, Asla, so much for your international law and co-director of the CILE Academy of International Law. It is my great pleasure to greet you all together with my dear colleague and Academy co-director uh, Patricia Gavoatelis. Our two guests today at this fireside chat need very little introduction, if at all, as they are global figures of international law and diplomacy. Patricia and I are simply delighted to be able to launch the second year of the NUS CILE Academy of International Law with this fire fireside chat with two true titans, and I don't use this word lightly, of international law today. Professor Tommy Ko and Professor Jaya Kumar, each who are also ambassadors at large for Singapore. During our chat, we will go into much more detail into the many achievements and contributions each has made to international law. But I must add that Professor Ko and Jaya Kumar are also the visionary founders of the Center for International Law. Professor Ko is the chair of the CIL Board of Governors and Professor Jaya Kumar, chair of the International Advisory Panel. They have been stalwart supporters and advisors of the Academy. I will now pass the microphone to my dear co-director of the Academy, Patricia. Thank you so much, uh, Nilofer, and uh, thanks so much, Prof Ko and Prof Jaya, for being with us to get today for marking uh, the launching of the second edition of the CILE Academy um, for International Law. This is a project that started last year during the pandemic. It was... <laughs> Uh, designed to um, uh, fill the gap of um, training in international law and also, of course, making use um, of this uh, virtual means that we all discovered so soon um, after the pandemic uh, hit us. And so we thought that it would be a good idea to have this academy in order to not to lose time and also to provide opportunities for uh, young scholars, young diplomats, uh, young professionals uh, from the region uh, to continue their training in international law. And um, the first edition, I think I can say with Nilofer, uh, was really an important uh, project and probably maybe the most um, um, interesting project we did during the pandemics because it really filled our hearts uh, with um, the uh, comments that we had at the end from the participants of the first cohort and so we decided to do it again and uh, we're very happy to again have over 150 applications um, and we're going to have an excellent group, I'm sure, um, from very diverse backgrounds, mostly from Southeast Asia, 
uh, but also from other corners of the world. So we're really uh, looking forward to from tomorrow on and until um, mid-December to welcome you on a daily basis, our participants. And uh, as you'll hear at the end, also on Wednesdays, uh, we'll be live streaming uh, our guest lectures. So uh, for the rest of the audience, you can also have a peek of what's going on at the Academy. So once again, uh, welcome uh, to this launching event. We're very proud to host the second edition and especially proud to host it with um, this fireside chat with Prof Chai and Prof Ko. And I'm sure we'll have a very interesting uh, conversation. So uh, back to you, Nilifer, for our first questions. Yeah, thank you so much, Patricia. So uh, what we will be doing uh, today is uh, Patricia and I will be asking questions uh, to um, Prof Ko and Jaya Kumar, and I will start with the first one. Um, <clears throat> to both um, Prof Ko and Prof Jaya. So the years 2020 and 2021, and we are getting close to the end of 2021, have been extremely challenging for the international community at many levels. What do you consider to be the most challenging or urgent issues now and also for the years to come? So that will be our starting question. And I leave it to you, uh, who would like to start? Uh. Jai, what do you go first? Okay, I'll, I'll have a go at it. <clears throat> You're right, there are many uh, pressing issues. My own personal view is on top of the list, I have two. One is climate change and the other is uh, cyber issues and ICT mm -hmm. issues, abuse and misuse. Mm -hmm. Of the two, climate change, I think is for me the most pressing issue because Failure to act by governments would be perilous for humanity and for the planet. Of course, the Paris Agreement in 2015 Please. was a major step uh, in the sense that you had a binding agreement. But although it's a binding agreement, the problem is it all depends on the pledges made by governments. And if you go by the assessment by organizations like the United Nations Environment Program, the assessment is that the pledges are insufficient and there is an emissions gap, so to speak. That is a gap between where we are likely to be and where we need to be. So this is quite exasperating, but why is it so difficult for the governments to do more. I've been involved in uh, some of the COP uh, discussions. As I see it, the problem is it requires political courage needed for governments to think long-term and carbon reduction measures are costly. And for some governments, it's difficult to sell to the public and businesses. Firstly, the benefits are not immediately realizable in the short term, but will benefit future generations. Secondly, it's not possible to quantify the benefits of a government's actions for that country because carbon reductions are for the global commons. Some governments may not be politically strong and do not have the appetite to think long term. They have to focus on immediate issues to win the next elections. So some of them actually kick the can down the road. So I think it is important really for younger generations in all the countries to, I hope they press, schedule, persuade, lobby their governments to do more because the younger generations have the greatest stake in climate change for the future. And the facts are staring at us on a daily basis, monthly basis, natural disasters from various parts of the world. So I think climate change for me is the top of the list. I mentioned cyber issues. I think that's another major issue. Misuse, abuse, weaponization of cyber for political goals, such as interfering in elections or for criminal ends, such as hacking into major systems for ransom. It's a new phenomenon. It's not easy to tackle. I think some tentative steps have been taken in the UN, such as a international group of experts 
and the open-ended panel in the UN. Will anything come of this? I hope so. I really hope so. But it's not easy because it's highly political, highly politicized. And moreover, some of the alleged offenders or culprits are actually state actors, although they're also non-state actors. So I will, I will just flag these two major issues from my perspective. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jayan. I, I agree with the two challenges you discussed, the challenge of climate change and what I would call the digital revolution of the world. You know? And I hope that in time, UN will convene a conference and consider adopting a multilateral treaty to deal with all these issues related to the digital revolution. The two challenges uppermost in my mind are COVID-19 and multilateralism. I hope the rich countries of the world could summon the political will to help the poorer countries um, acquire vaccines so they can vaccinate their people and, and uh, we can progressively reduce the threat of COVID-19 to the health and well-being of the people of the world. But related to this, the world must also cooperate with one another for the recovery of the economy, the health of society, and the psychological well-being of our citizens. So COVID-19 to me is one of the biggest challenges, challenges facing us. The other challenge is multilateralism. I, I discern around the world a rise of nationalism, of populism, a reduction in the political will to cooperate and uh, a tendency by great powers to resort to unilateral action. But as we know, all these big problems in the world cannot be resolved, resolved by any one country. And there's no alternative to international cooperation and multilateralism. I'll stop there. Oops. Yeah, thank you both. Um, I think you've really hit upon four key challenges. Um, and Prof. Uh, Jayakumar, I mean, how far can we kick the can down the road? I think we've come to the end, it seems, with all the natural disasters happening right now. And, uh, but it is the youth, there's no doubt about it. And, and, and Prof Ko, I mean, multilateralism is definitely being challenged. And yet with the pandemic, we see how important it mm. is. So, so thank you. And by the way, to our participants, after Patricia and I have asked our questions, of course, we will open up the platform for your questions. So if you permit me, I will go on to the next question. Um, as I alluded to, of course, in my, in, in my introduction, both of you have such incredibly rich and extensive experience that we're all envious of in international negotiations, international lawmaking at the absolute highest levels. Um, Prof. Ko, you were president of the, the United Nations um, Conference in the Law of the Sea, the third one. Um, also, uh, chair of the Preparatory Committee for the UN Conference of the Environment held in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, an absolutely landmark uh, conference on the environment. Chief negotiator of the US-Singapore Free Trade Agreement. You chaired two dispute panels at WTO, and I can go on. But I, I have to add here, um, you have a very well-known article you wrote, My Adventures with International Law. And there is irony that in it, you explain that you, know, you actually didn't like your international law class. <laughs> and here you became, you know, one of the, the, the it became your career and then really at a very big level. Prof. Jaya, my gosh, you also have unbelievable experience um, as a, as a, diplomat, foreign minister, you've worn so many hats in Singapore, actually. Um, and so you have a, an incredible experience at the political level as well. But you have a, uh, represented a Singapore at UN forums at the highest level, bilateral negotiations with neighboring countries, you negotiated a defense cooperation agreement and extradition treaty with Indonesia 
And I understand you negotiated. This is a package with your dear friend, uh, the late foreign minister, Ali Alatash. As foreign minister, I know you were also engaged in a very important forum, the Forum of Small States. I read, you know, I have to, I really have to encourage all our participants to read the books written by both Prof Ko and Jaya Kumar. But in your books, you have many anecdotes, great anecdotes from your term as foreign minister. Um, and also on the question of how um, Singapore uh, was able to make itself such um, uh, a relevant player in, in international law. So how was that? Um, how was it that Singapore um, became such a, uh, uh, and I can, I can attest to this, really um, uh, has a significant voice in international law making at the UN. Tommy, you want to have a go? Yeah. Okay. Um, to be a small country like Singapore is both a disadvantage and sometimes an advantage. Because we are small, we are non-threatening. We can be relevant and useful to other countries by acting as a bridge, as a facilitator, as a mediator. So I was often called upon to take on this role, whether in chairing the UNCLOS or, or chairing the negotiation at the Earth Summit or chairing dispute panels at uh, WTO. You know? So I say, it is our karma, our destiny as a very small country um, to be relevant and useful to the world by being a, a thought leader, a facilitator, a mediator, a conciliator. I might just add <clears throat> to what Tommy said that sometimes when you're a small country, and you make proposals, people do not suspect you of having some yeah. motives like the big powers may have. So if you look back in past few decades, some of the ideas that have come about through ASEAN uh, were germinated by Singapore. Asia-Europe meeting, ASEAN regional forum, being a small country, when you propose this, it's, I guess, easier for other parties to come around and accept it. But we can only do this if your good faith is not questioned, you appear sincere, and you're willing to shepherd your proposals. It's easy to come out with ideas, but you have to work through your colleagues in ASEAN, and your counterparts in Asia and in Europe. Only then you can come across as being bona fide and you're also seen as making an effort to get it to work near the floor. Thank you. And uh, and, and you, you raised us and I'm going to go on to the third question, but I also should say it'd be wonderful for you to, both of you to give us you know, you, glimpses into what are some of the the secrets of successful negotiating. Uh, and I, I think that Singapore certainly and yourselves have certainly shown that. Um, and so I'll go into the third question here. Um, and this, you know, leads into uh, ASEAN, a very important organization that both of you have had uh, foundational input into. Prof Jaya, you were the eminent person group appointed by ASEAN leaders to recommend us uh, elements for the ASEAN Charter, and Prof Ko was in the high-level task force, which actually drafted the ASEAN Charter. Um, can you both share with us and the audience your experiences in making the ASEAN Charter uh, a very important regional organization? And also looking back, how do you feel that ASEAN is doing? Is it meeting its objectives? And what are the current challenges? How do you see the next decade for ASEAN? Open question, really, so that we can get uh, yeah. your valuable insights. Uh, Jai, you want to go first? I, I, okay, I will start first, uh, Nilufa, because we have, you said that we have an audience uh, today of from 63 countries, am I right? Yes. 
60. Yes, yes, so around the world. I'm not sure how how many in our esteemed audience uh, know about ASEAN. And I say that because I often come across misconceptions and misunderstandings of ASEAN, particularly from our friends in Europe, because our friends in Europe tend to view regional organizations and ASEAN through the lens of the European model. And Europe, EU, as you know, has certain attributes, which is you cannot become a member of EU unless you agree to some prerequisites, conditionalities on legal, constitutional, and also economic uh, uh, prerequisites. But ASEAN is entirely a different creature. When it was formed in 1961, 67, 67 sorry, it was a, a group of disparate countries, some having systems of elections, some were monarchy, some were uh, and the military, military, <laughs> military government that came uh, through a coup d'etat. Some were strong arm uh, leaders like in Indonesia, Sohato, completely disparate countries. And yet, despite our differences, we formed ASEAN for strategic reasons. And it was remarkable that ASEAN was formed. And even more remarkable that after 40 years, ASEAN has worked well. And for lawyers in our audience, you may find it strange that ASEAN came about and operated for some four decades or more without having a constitution or charter. So this is what Nilifer referred to the ASEAN charter. Only in 2008, am I right, Tommy? 2008, uh, 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 earlier, uh, uh, we adopted the charter. Uh, yeah, 2008. 2005 was the EPG report. Yeah. And so it's some 45 years later that we have finally had a constitution. So it's, a, it's something strange, but it's a reality that uh, describes ASEAN, a diversity, diverse groups, we, we made it work. Uh, and you asked about challenges for ASEAN. I think one is to press on with a deeper integration, both economically as well as uh, cooperation, such as in situations like COVID and other situations. And the other aspect of ASEAN is being a grouping of small countries and large countries like Indonesia. We have been able to be a relevant player in to engage the major powers in our region, such, such as through dialogue relationships, such as through ASEAN plus uh, dialogue situations, as well as in forums like uh, ASEAN Regional Forum. Now, as far as the ASEAN Charter, Tommy and I uh, worked closely. I was first a member of the eminent persons group. Uh, the leaders charged us to come out with bold ideas for the Charter. And because most of the eminent persons group were former foreign ministers who knew each other, we had a very good uh, sense of camaraderie and we were able to come up with a unanimous recommendation for the charter. Some bold ideas, uh, I'll give you one bold idea was that we recommended in the charter there should be specific provisions for temporary suspension of the rights and privileges of member states for serious violations of charter principles. Just to give you an example, uh, and. The next step was for the high level group to actually draft the charter, which they did. And Tommy Co played a key role in that uh, process. I'll pass over to Tommy. Yeah, thank you, Jaya. Thank you. Yeah, right. so I want to repeat a couple of points made by Jaya. Uh, number one, Southeast Asia is a much more diverse region than, than Europe. The countries and people of Southeast Asia speak different languages, worship different gods, have different cultures, 
Yet, in spite of all our differences, we have been able to come together through ASEAN. We are a, a community. We have developed a single market. And we are beginning to, to be able to work closely together, both at home and on the international stage. My second point is that ASEAN is rightly described as the second most successful regional organization in the world after the European Union. But ASEAN and the European Union are fundamentally different. Yeah. ASEAN is still an intergovernmental organization where the, the countries are sovereign. They have not pulled their sovereignty. In the case of the European Union, it's, uh, it, it, it's not just a, a, a organization, inter, it's not just an intergovernmental organization. In the case of the European Union, the 27 member states have actually pulled their sovereignty in specific areas like trade, environment, and so on, you know? And when we were drafting the charter, I said to my colleagues that the European Union is an inspiration, but it's not a model. Um, challenges going forward, um, I think we should complete our journey in integrating our 10 economies into one. We are close to the end, but the last mile is always the most difficult. The second challenge is to maintain our unity in the face of very intense rivalry between the United States and China. There's a danger that we will become disunited. If we become disunited, we will be of no use to the world. ASEAN can only be the chairman of the regional groupings and forums because we are united and we are neutral. So ASEAN centrality depends on our unity and our neutrality. There are limits to what ASEAN can do. Uh, you take the Myanmar crisis as an example. We do not impose sanctions on countries in spite of their behavior. Our philosophy in managing a country like Myanmar in crisis is to try to talk to all the stakeholders, to persuade them to come back to the negotiating table, to persuade them that in order to build a better future, they must reconcile and come to a new agreement on power sharing. That's our agenda. So our agenda is very different from those of the European Union and the United States. We, we don't punish the military regime. We don't, we don't impose sanctions on them. But we, are, we have appointed a special envoy, the foreign minister of Brunei, Erwan, and he will be embarking soon on his first trip to Myanmar. And hopefully he will be given access to all the stakeholders. And hopefully he can persuade all the stakeholders to stop all this violence and detention of uh, political leaders, that there's no alternative for the future of Myanmar, but for them to come back to the negotiating table. Uh, <clears throat> thank you both so much. And, and, and I have to say, um, to me, one of the benefits of moving to Singapore almost two years ago now was really to, it has a history and it's, it was established some decades ago. Um, so um, I, I, the point taken um, that we can't talk about one size fits all type of regional organizations um, and Southeast Asia has its own dynamics. So I, I'm hoping that we'll have more questions from the audience uh, on ASEAN because it is a very important regional organization and you've highlighted the current global tensions. And those are big time challenges for countries that already have their own domestic challenges. So I will go on to what will be my, um, my last question before I, I turn the floor over um, to, to um, my dear colleague, <laughs> Patricia. And here we're going to go into a topic that's uh, one of my favorite, of course, and that has to do with uh, the law of the sea, oceans law, 
And uh, here we have uh, Prof. Kahl and Prof. Jaya, you were both um, directly engaged in the making of the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention. As I said earlier, Prof. Kahl, of course, is the very famous president of the Third Conference. And, um, and Prof. Jaya, you were involved in the negotiations. Uh, we were just talking earlier that next year is going to be the 40th anniversary. Unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. Um, so since both of you were um, involved in this, and really the convention is a remarkable treaty. Um, it is extensive. It is one of the most comprehensive treaties with over 300 articles. It took nine years to negotiate. Um, one really wonders whether we could even have the Law of the Sea Convention if we're negotiated today. So upon reflection, you know, what made this, um, the, the negotiations and the convention itself successful? And again, you know, if you could also give us some highlights, some insights into what, what is the secret to successful negotiations? Has it changed over time? And I really love to get, you know, you've had so many years of experience within the UN system and maybe how you might've seen changes as well. So I turn the floor over to you. Hmm. Okay, maybe I go first. Jai? Yes, please. Yes, just yes. tell me. Uh, the third UN conference on the law of the sea succeeded because it answered a felt need. When it began, there was legal chaos in the world. Countries did not agree on the maximum breadth of the territorial sea. They couldn't agree on the fishing rights of coastal states. And I would, for example, remind everybody, I mean, it seems really incredible that the United Kingdom and Iceland actually had a short war over fish. You know, there were no agreement on fishing rights, no agreement on the maximum limit of continental shell, no agreement on what to do with the resources that were located in a seabed and ocean floor beyond the limits of national jurisdiction and so on. So, so it took us nine years to achieve consensus and to agree on these very difficult questions. It, it's a miracle that we, we were able to do it. I doubt in today's climate that we will be able to succeed, you know. Um, I want to just conclude by saying a couple of points about Angkor. I'm very concerned that 39 years after the adoption of Angkor, there are some countries that are seeking to, to diminish its, its importance, to say that Angkor is just another law. You know, It is not the primary law. It is not what I once call it, the constitution of the world's ocean. And secondly, uh, UNCLOS is not a static law, you know. By adopting, implementing resolutions, we have been able to accommodate new changes in the world. So on fisheries, for example, we had an implementing resolution. And if the conference on BBNJ succeed, we will have a new implementing resolution on the biodiversity found beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. And, and the final point I want to make is that some of the new detractors of UNCLOS are spreading the falsehood that UNCLOS is a product of the West. So why should we, the developing countries, uh, bother about UNCLOS? UNCLOS is not a product of the West. UNCLOS is negotiated by over 150 countries, the majority of which were developing countries. UNCLOS is a revolutionary treaty, you know. It contains so many new concepts of international law. It reflected the aspirations of the developing countries to make a new legal order for the oceans. Uh, Nilifa, I completely agree with Tommy, who played such a key role in the successful conclusion of UNCLOS. I think it's a myth to say that uh, UNCLOS reflects the interests of Western or developed countries. In fact, I remember in the early days, and you got to take the early days as a UN Seabed Committee, a committee 
common heritage of mankind discussions, it was the group of developing coastal states from Africa and Latin America who made a strong push for extended uh, territorial sea and economic zone. And their argument was for decades, their resources, living and non-living resources had been exploited by the rich advanced uh, countries. And this was a push by the developing countries to recover what they felt rightfully should belong to them. So it is both the developing and developed countries together who worked uh, for the successful uh, conclusion of UNCLOS. Can I go on to uh, answer your question about some insights into the UNCLOS? Indeed, UNCLOS posed very unique challenges. And Tomiko and I have actually written about the complicated negotiation okay. process in the volume one of the Virginia commentaries. First of all, there were many interest groups whose interests had to be uh, taken to account. The coastal states groups, the landlocked geographically disadvantaged group, the straits groups, the archipelagic groups, countries which had interests in fisheries and so on. Uh, secondly, the conference was unusual because unprecedented role and discretion was given to individual chairmen and, yeah. and key people like uh, chairman of the working groups, the committees and reporters like Mr. Satyanandan. It was so complex that the conference had no choice but to give uh, these roles to individuals uh, in the conference although they were representatives of their own governments to try in good faith to broker compromises. And the other interesting thing about that conference, which probably set a pattern for future large conferences was that you had many processes working at the same time. You could have had the whole plenary session uh, taking place in one day, but at the same time, there would be informal and even secret negotiations going on outside the conference uh, premises to try to hammer out difficult roles. And sometimes the secret groups would surface a paper or non-paper and see whether it gets any traction in the larger group. So it's a quite a fascinating uh, conference. And I, and I think most many of us who were there learned valuable lessons in negotiations and reaching compromises. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. And uh, if I can just pipe in, I, the point about <clears throat> the Law of the Sea Convention was really the first major convention uh, negotiated in the post-colonial period. And when you look at the leaders such as Tommy Coe, Satya Nandan, and so many more, they're all coming from the developing countries at that time. We look at um, the whole uh, exclusive economic zone was introduced by Africa, Kenya, the Asian African Legal Consultative Organization. I think the developing world should take pride in the Law of the Sea Convention and certain countries should not try and diminish it now because I fully agree. Uh, it is, it is a, a convention that reflected the balance of the world at the time, including the former Soviet Union. So maybe we can have more questions on that because I think we really have to take advantage of your experience uh, in this, uh, you know, remarkable convention. Uh, now, anyway, but I shouldn't be talking so much because now <laughs> it's my pleasure to turn over uh, for the next set of questions to dear Patricia. So the floor is yours. And thank you so much, uh, Professors Ko and Jayakumar. Thank you so much, Nilfer, and thanks uh, so much to Prof. Kong, Prof. Jaya for what's been a, a very interesting conversation so far. Uh, we are really eager um, to get all the details because uh, uh, you are, um, I think, two of the most, uh, well, certainly in Singapore, but I think also throughout the world, the most experienced international lawyers and negotiators 
And so it's such a privilege uh, to be able to have uh, this um, insights directly from you. So I want to move on now. I mean, we've covered contemporary challenges, um, your experiences as negotiators, ASEAN, uh, the question of the oceans and UNCLOS. Uh, but I want to move now to um, uh, a slightly different area, which is the area of third party dispute resolution, which is also an area where both of you have been um, involved directly on behalf of Singapore in settling uh, issues with neighbors um, through third party uh, dispute resolution mechanisms. And that's also, I think, um, a, an important experience um, for Singapore, for the region, but also for the world. I mean, it, I think it's uh, very important to uh, see um, uh, this case is also in the broader light of the importance of uh, international peaceful mm -hmm. dispute settlements. Um, so I wanted to ask you about, the, you know, you've played both of you uh, key roles in cases involving Singapore and its neighbors before the ICJ and it laws with the land reclamation case and Pedro Banca cases. Um, can you share a bit of your experience regarding uh, these cases? How were they important for Singapore? Um, uh, what uh, are the pros and cons um, of bringing these cases to third party uh, re dispute resolution mechanisms? Uh, what are the main considerations that come into play um, when such a decision is being taken and, and whether they also reveal um, uh, trends in ASEAN countries uh, regarding third party dispute settlements. So a more um, a broader question about the relevance, uh, the pros and cons, how to bring these cases to uh, dispute settlement and the importance that that means for a country like Singapore. I don't know which one of you wants to start. Tommy, you um, want to go or you want me to go? Uh, you go first, yeah. Okay, uh, hi Patricia. Uh, first, uh, I'll give some broad brush uh, comments. I don't think it necessarily reflects a trend, but some of the cases you referred to, the reclamation case, the Pedro Branca case, and if I mention also the case between Malaysia and Indonesia, the Sipadan and Ligitan case, uh, these concerned countries, neighboring countries in ASEAN, I think it, it does speak well for the ASEAN countries to be able to have agreed to have recourse to third party dispute settlement. Although in the reclamation case, it was a unilateral uh, invocation of chapter seven by, by Malaysia, but Singapore did not object to the jurisdiction and participated in the case. And eventually, Tommy played a great role in, in bringing about uh, the resolution of that case. Uh, why I think I say this is, speaks well for the countries is that I do believe it requires political will and a big picture approach by the leadership of countries to agree to such dispute settlement especially, and I'll say especially when it comes to territorial sovereignty, because territorial sovereignty is always sensitive, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, especially when you do not know how the tribunal is going to decide in your favor or not in your favor. Yeah, there's no certainty of a win. So, and the governments may come in for strong criticism, even if one inch of the territory is perceived to have been lost, in the case of Malaysia and Singapore and Pedro Branca, that we agreed, the leaders agreed to third party dispute settlement, I believe because they realized the big picture. Why hold the overall relations, bilateral relations between both countries hostage to one issue? There are many other economic and political uh, relationships uh, in play between the both countries. And the leaders agreed that to take this item, shall we say, offline and have it settled by a third party, which in this case was the ICJ. Now, that requires uh, some bold and courageous step politically, especially when you do not know how it's going to end up. You may think you have a good case, but you really do not know how mm -hmm. it'll go in the court. So mm -hmm. 
I want to emphasize this big picture aspect and why I, I think it is spoke well for the countries to have resorted to third party dispute resolution in those cases. Tommy, would you like to take over? Yeah, thank you, Diane. Um, I agree with Diane. The peaceful settlement dispute is very important to the whole world, big countries and small countries. And if, if we cannot resolve our differences through negotiation, I think the best outcome is for us to agree to take it to a third party. It can be conciliation, it can be mediation, it can be fact finding, it can be arbitration, it can be adjudication. There are many modalities, but the important point is if negotiations fail, we should agree to try to resolve it by third party procedures. And, and I, on this, my second point is that the ASEAN countries have a good track record. Cambodia and Thailand settle a very important dispute over a temple, Priya Vihya. Malaysia and Singapore had two disputes over Padravanka, also land reclamation, that went in one case to ICJ, another case went to arbitration, then eighth laws, then fact finding, and then back to negotiation. Indonesia and Malaysia took the dispute over two islands to ICG. So the ASEAN countries have a relatively good track record. And Myanmar, by the way, uh, settled their maritime boundary dispute with uh, neighboring Bangladesh by taking it to its law. So Myanmar also is part of this. In comparison, the countries in Northeast Asia do not have a good track record. And I want to use this forum to appeal in particular to my good friends in China. China's existing policy is that it will only settle dispute through negotiation. It will not take disputes, especially involving territorial sovereignty to a third party. And I want to appeal to my Chinese friends that if they believe in the rule of law, which I think they do, then they have to consider reconsider their national policy. It is it's not good enough to say, I will only settle my dispute through negotiation. We all know negotiations sometimes are protracted and ultimately unsuccessful. So are we going to allow this dispute to fester? Are we, are we going to allow the dispute to be resolved by force, depending which country is more powerful? We can't accept that. We want the rule of law to prevail. And among other things, it means that countries in Northeast Asia, Japan, China, and the Republic of Korea must accept that if, if a dispute cannot be resolved through negotiation, they must agree to take it to a third party. Thank you so much to both of you for this. Uh very important comments and for highlighting also the, um, uh, the positive experiences with third party um, uh, mechanisms uh, in, in Asian countries. Um, it is um, very, very interesting to note that uh, um, this is not, I mean, an experience um, uh, that all countries um, have had um, in, in, in the wider region. Um, but but it is um, still uh, interesting that um, uh, it, it has been considered by uh, Singapore and other countries in 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 Southeast Asia uh, that uh, we've had um, this um, this question of uh, bringing the countries. Uh, okay, ah, there you are. I okay. think it okay. is very good. Now <laughs> this is very very strange experience and um, so I will try to uh, resume I'm, I apologize so I'm, I'm back okay I can see that um, no I was just saying that it's uh, um, I think it's uh, when every state is thinking whether to take a case to third party um, uh, settlement it, it, it has to face that dilemma that you were both mentioning um, it, it's an important, I mean, it, territorial issues, sovereignty issues are very important issues. And there's always a fear that, um, you know, politically uh, there may be because the result of third party uh, settlement is, is always uncertain. So 
uh, there's always a fear that uh, you may lose the, the case. So that's, uh, that's when I was thinking about the pros and cons. I think that's certainly a con um, in terms of, um, you know, whether a state wants to take a, something to, to third party resolution. But I think the point that Prof. Jaya made of the political will and, and seeing the big picture and, and what uh, Prof. Kaw said about uh, uh, the rule of law prevailing, those are really important considerations and, uh, and um, Indeed, Singapore has been a, a very good example um, and also other states in the region. So let me narrow down the question now. Also, it has to do with third party um, uh, dispute settlement, but perhaps is a more uh, controversial aspect or more provocative question um, in the sense that in a lot of this third party um, uh, dispute settlement cases before the ICJ or it laws, um, we see and, and I say that also coming from Portugal, a smaller country in that in that area, um, we see that there is an absence of Asians and third world country um, international lawyers in the legal teams uh, before ICJ and it laws. Um, and and uh, Prof Jaya, you've uh, written a book with a very suggestive title, um, which is called "Be at the Table" or "Be on the Menu." I think that's really a great title and really describes uh, very well this uh, issue that there seems to be an absence of international lawyers from Asian and third world countries in legal teams before the ICJ and its laws, and and rather. Uh, Anglo-Saxon predominance, um, sometimes with some lawyers from French-speaking countries. Um, what do you think could be changed um, or could be done to change the state of affairs? Um, and I would ask the question to both of you, but maybe Prof. Uh, Jaya would, would start <laughs> on this one, uh, given the provocative title of his book, Prof. Jaya. Well, as I said in my book, <clears throat> as, a, as a minister, I originally hoped to retire in 2006 uh, when I thought I would be still fit to have a second career. And what that second career might be was to embark on one of my pet, uh, uh, shall we say, grievances, which was this, that when you look at the list of lawyers appearing before uh, ICJ or ITLOS or other major international tribunals, it is dominated or rather, in fact, confined to a group of, say, 20 to 30 uh, repute, reputed lawyers, mainly from the Anglo-Saxon world. And their names crop up, either as ad hoc judges or defense uh, yeah. play, uh, play, advocates for one side or the other. Uh, mm -hmm. They all are very good, but... Yeah. I was struck by the fact that uh, there are very few Asian or third world countries represented in this, shall we say, uh, mafia <laughs> before international tribunals. Why is that? Is that because there is a dearth or paucity of uh, good legal talent? Clearly not, because all of us have come across uh, very competent and able uh, advocates and councils in our respective countries. So it was my hope uh, at that time, together with people like Tommy and a few friends from the region, to form a, a consortium of uh, Asian international <laughs> lawyers, hopefully to make some inroads into this. But as things worked out, I was asked to stay on in, in cabinet for many more years. So that dream <laughs> did not realize. I still have the dream that one day to see young lawyers, talented lawyers from Asia, Africa, or Latin America, break this monopoly and see them appearing in some of these cases. And uh, I hope one day that uh, dream will be realized. You asked me what, how to change this. I don't think uh, it's a lack of people. I don't think a, there's a big bang approach. It has to be gradual, both the lawyers from these countries, as well as the governments, must make a concerted effort to expose these young lawyers, upcoming lawyers, to the international networking, to appear in conferences, to be members of or participate in meetings of uh, uh, ILC. Uh, Nilofer is an excellent example. 
uh, UNSID trial and other legal circuits, get themselves exposed, make themselves known, and uh, hopefully they will also appear in, in international cases. And they cannot achieve stardom overnight through a process of uh, increased experiences. I think it is achievable. I don't know. What do you think, Tommy? Uh, I agree. I agree. And for this, this is one of the reasons which motivated Judge Owada and me and some other like-minded colleagues to establish the Asian Society International Law. We wanted to bring Asian international law together and we, we was hoping that in the long run, the Asian international lawyer would be as influential as the European international lawyer, as the American international lawyer. Um, it has partly to do with uh, capacity building, but it is also incumbent upon the governments of the developing countries to have confidence in our own experts and to appoint them as our counsel, as our consultant, because I observe that the tendency for developing countries to appoint the same people from the little mafia to represent them, you know. So we gotta, we gotta break this by having more confidence in our own experts uh, from, from our own country, our region, from the third world, and to gradually build up the profile, the stature, the influence of Asian international lawyers. Thank you so much. I, I mean, I, I hope there's still, um, uh, part, I mean, that it's still part of uh, your uh, dream to pursue this <laughs> because it's an important, it's an important issue. Uh, and I, I agree that uh, what you've said about capacity building and networking, um, uh, these are really uh, important uh, ways to bring um, uh, and, and, and to uh, allow, um, you know, young international yeah. lawyers or more established international lawyers to get uh, yeah. um, the spotlight yeah. also in the world stage. Um, it seems to me that, uh, you know, once you've had an experience um, as lawyer counsel before the ICJ and it laws, then, then you're able to continue. Um, the difficult part is doing it for the first time. Um, and so um, what you're saying about the um, confidence of uh, the developing countries themselves in putting uh, in their team, not only the uh, the big names that are usually come before um, these international bodies, but also um, um, their own from their own country or from other developing countries. It's a way to promote that. Yeah. And and we do hope, I mean, with a lot of modesty, I would say Nilofar and I hope that also CIL can help um, in that respect, in the capacity building yeah. and, um, and preparation of young lawyers and also in, in networking. And, and my last question has to do also with the CIL and in particular with CIL E Academy, uh, because we've put together this training program, as I said in the beginning, um, uh, having in mind, especially the pandemic, the fact that people were not being able to travel, that uh, training opportunities were being postponed or canceled. Um, so this has been an example also of how uh, in this new world we can do, um, we can continue the conversation about training and improving um, uh, capacity building in, in international law in the region. Uh, so I wanted to ask you as a last question um, about how has uh, CIL in general fared um, during COVID and in particular about the initiative of the CILE Academy. So how, how well do you think CIL adapted to this new virtual reality um, involved um, imposed by the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, do you think that CIL should continue to do virtual events um, going forward? Um, what do you think are the advantages of having an E Academy of International Law um, whose uh, second edition we're launching today after the successful first edition? So some concluding uh, thoughts from your part also on the role of CIL and the Academy and the future of this type of events. I don't know who wants to start. Um, it's up to you. Okay, I'll have a go at it. And, uh, first, you, you asked for thoughts on uh, whether we should continue with uh, virtual or uh, physical events. I think COVID 
has had a silver lining for CIL in that CIL had no choice but to harness technology and use <coughs> the technology of the internet and Zoom to reach out to, and you have reached out to more people and through more countries than I think it was possible with uh, physical events. So I think that has been uh, a great achievement. For example, today, over 60 countries, uh, over 250 participants for the e-academy. I think that's very creditable. Credi creditable. Uh, of course, you may have different views as to whether we should do virtual or physical or a hybrid. I hope that we do not abandon the virtual uh, model, even when things return to quote unquote normal, if ever that was possible. Because through your virtual mode, you have been able to reach out to more countries, more people, and there are many participants who financially cannot afford to travel to faraway places. There are participants who may have various kinds of uh, physical impairments, uh, handicapped or uh, other impairments, and they can participate. So I'm also aware that there's a downside to virtual modes in that the physical networking, mm -hmm. the chat, in the sidelines with the world coffee and so on, uh, that is lost. So perhaps we should think of uh, hybrid. Uh, Tommy, mm -hmm. myself, and Nilofer yes. have been discussing this. Yeah. Now, the other question about thoughts about advantages of the academy. I think CIL has, has done a great job and whether physical or virtual, I hope the idea of the CIL's Academy uh, of International Law will continue at regular intervals. I think it gives a great advantage and opportunity for the younger practitioners and scholars and students of international law to benefit from this interaction uh, with well-known experts and luminaries in specific areas of international law at the Academy. Uh, I hope it will grow from strength to strength and be an established uh, academy in, in this part of the world uh, with followers and, and participants from various parts of the world. Thank you. Tom? Uh, I agree with you. Thank you so, so much. Um, uh, it is indeed a fact that uh, with the virtual world, we reach more people, <laughs> um, people that would not be able to uh, travel to Singapore, uh, but that we do miss out on the um, networking, person-to-person -person networking, which is uh, still very, very important. So perhaps the, um, the hybrid events in the future, or a mix of uh, in-person and, yeah. and, and virtual events will be, um, will be the solution. But I agree that, I mean, most likely we will have to continue. And, and at the same time, it will be a pity not to continue exploring uh, these mm -hmm. new possibilities. So uh, now maybe it's time for um, uh, the questions from our audience who've been active in typing um, uh, questions. Yeah. Uh, we have a number of questions uh, related to ASEAN, um, uh, related to UNCLOS, um, yeah. uh, to Myanmar. Um, I don't know, Nilfer, do you want to take a pick of at one or two questions? And then I'll take uh, one or two more afterwards. Uh, we have, um, we've been, been followed by a regular number of participants and I know a lot more are following on Facebook live, but only the ones that are in Zoom are able to uh, put the questions in the chat. So maybe Nilofer, do you want to pick one or two questions? Thank you, thank you so much. And it really has been a wonderful discussion and I'm, I'm happy we have questions to follow up on. Um, I will take the first, actually the first two questions, um, and there's one for Professor Tommy Ko and also Professor Jami Kumar, 
Jaya Kumar. Um, Beijing is talking about multilateralism with Asian characteristics and has proposed a new ASEAN-China Treaty on Good Neighborliness will include this concept. Do you think it is necessary to have multilateralism with Asian characteristics? The question for Professor Jaya Kumar, what is your view about the Chinese approach to have an ASEAN-China Treaty on Good Neighborliness when overlapping claims in the South China Sea remain unsettled? So interesting question. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm, um, maybe Jai, I begin. You want me to take the question first? Okay, why don't you go first? Uh, I'm not sure what the gentleman terms of his question about Chinese approach of an ASEAN China treaty on good neighborliness. Yeah. Uh, I'm <laughs> not sure what treaty is being referred to. Hmm. Perhaps, perhaps, Tommy, maybe yeah. it's a reference to Code of Conduct? Yes, I think so. Well, if it's a reference to Code of Conduct, this is an exercise both uh, by ASEAN and China together. It's a Code of Conduct. And I don't think anybody can really oppose uh, the formulation of a Code of Conduct, which can be mutually agreed to. I think the question is, uh, is it inconsistent to have such a code of conduct when overlapping claims have remained unsettled? If that is a question, I don't think there's an inconsistency. Perhaps, perhaps you can say it's all the more important when you have unresolved claims to have an agreed approach. How do you conduct yourselves? How do you conduct your relations? how do you con conduct uh, uh, and manage disputes because there are overlapping claims. So that will be my answer. That I don't see a contradiction between having a court conduct, even though the claims themselves as to who has sovereignty over what waters and what features have not been resolved. In fact, if, if there's substance to the code of conduct, it may be not a bad idea. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> let me just let me just add to what Jaya said that the ASEAN perspective is that the disputes in the South China Sea are governed by international law, including UNCLOS, and that um, this is the starting point. You know, um, between ASEAN and China, we've gone through two stages we adopted a declaration of conduct, <clears throat> which is 19 years old this year, it'll be 20 years next year. And we are currently negotiating a follow-up to the declaration, which is a code of conduct. The question whether it will be legally binding or not is still on the agenda. But whether we have a code of conduct or not, doesn't neutralize the important point that the disputes between China and the claimant states of ASEAN are governed by international law, including UNCLOS. And the ASEAN countries appeal to China is that, let's try to, if possible, come to an agreement through negotiations or through joint development. But if we are not successful in resolving this dispute through negotiation, through uh, joint development, let us take the dispute to a third party. And I think the burden is on China. The obstacle now is with, with China. So far, the Chinese have said no. And I want to appeal to them that, that they should seriously reconsider the national policy that they will not take disputes involving territorial sovereignty to a third party. Let me maybe take another question. I mean, I see that uh, the chat is still very active. 
Um, and I would like to um, take this next uh, question from Kente, um, who was asking about uh, uh, climate change in, um, in the specific um, context of the Biden administration, um, where he says that uh, with the Biden mm -hmm. administration, the US-China relation has improved. Um, has this improved the speed of climate change efforts, policy sorry, taken? Sorry, sorry let, let me stop you. Did you say yes. US-China relation has improved? That's, I'm, I'm saying that's, that's the, the what the question <laughs> says. That's well, what that's, the question says. But I suppose be... it's it's in, in the specific area of, um, of uh, climate change and, and, and the possibility of um, speeding up uh, climate change efforts um, um, to tackle climate change. Uh, but of course, I mean, you can also comment on the broader question of US-China relationships outside of climate change. Um, but so uh, the question is about the US-China um, the efforts to tackle climate change um, uh, and uh, the, um, the fact that the world is looking towards these two superpowers to take the lead. And this is, I mean, of course, a good question in the run-up to the COP26 in Glasgow um uh, in 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 a few months uh, time so but of course uh, prof go i'm very happy if you also comment on a broader us china relationship uh, and whether it has uh, improved or not no no <laughs> I, I don't want to do that but i want to respectfully point out to the person who posed the question that his or her assumption is wrong president biden has essentially adopted president trump's china policy Relations between US and China are not getting better. That's my first point. My second point is President Biden would like to isolate cooperation on climate change from the, the whole broad bilateral relation. And the special envoy, John Kerry, was in China recently, uh, met with the Chinese chief negotiator on climate change, virtually, not in person. And, uh, and also the foreign minister, Wang Yi. I, I was disappointed. Wang Yi said basically that our cooperation with China on climate change will depend on our overall relationship. You know, that's, that's not good news for the world. You know, we know that overall relationship between you and China is not good, but climate change should be isolated from this toxic relationship because it, it is in the interest of both countries and of the world for the two biggest emitters of greenhouse gases to work cooperatively and energetically to make the not next COP event in Glasgow a success, to, to be more ambitious than they have been in the past, you know. So, so I want to say to United States and China that your overall relationship may be toxic, but there are areas in which you can work together for your mutual benefit and the benefit of the world. And climate change is one of them. The oceans is another. Biodiversity is another. The digital revolution that's really changed the world is another area where the two countries can work together. You know? So don't make everything hostage to to the toxic bilateral relationship. I agree with Tommy and I have very little to add, except to say that in the context of climate change, <clears throat> in addition to what Tommy said, one of the underlying tensions is also the tensions between the developing countries and the developed countries. <clears throat> Some of the developed countries say, well, they've already done as much as they can or got to contribute as much as <clears> they can. But the developing countries strongly feel that for many years, the advanced industrialized countries have <clears throat> gotten away with a lot and the, the greater burden on them. So the, you have this underlying tensions and you also have the underlying tensions, not only of, of reduction of the emissions, but also contributions financially <clears throat> uh, to assist the developing countries. So you have these kinds of tensions going on. But I agree with Tommy that these two major superpowers have to set the lead. Thank you.
Thank you so much. And perhaps, I mean, one of the subjects that you touched upon, uh, especially Prof. Ko, um, in your in your introductory remarks on uh, um, on current challenges, was related to uh, COVID nineteen. And I mean, it's still an unavoidable question. And we have a question from uh, one of the participants um, uh, asking about um, uh, COVID nineteen and the question of vaccine nationalism uh, during COVID nineteen. Um, and and how many con developed countries and again tensions between developed and developing countries? How many developed countries have accumulated a surplus of vaccines? Um, and the question is, how can international law respond to this issue? I mean, this is of course something that it's on, on our minds, uh, all of yeah. us, um, and, and perhaps uh, Prof. Ko yeah. and, and Prof. Jai, if you want to address this issue. So I, I think this is an issue of life and death for many developing countries. And it is really a litmus test of whether the advanced country believe in multilateralism or not. The Director General of World Health Organization has been very provocative. He described the current situation as one of vaccine apartheid, you know, where the rich countries have more than enough, in fact, they now have a surplus of vaccine and the rest of the world have a huge deficit, you know. We must ramp up the COVAX facility in WHO. Rich countries which have now a surplus of over 1 billion doses of, of vaccine should more generously share them with the developing world, especially with Africa. But even here in ASEAN, you know, if you look at the 10 ASEAN countries, apart from Singapore, no other country has rich 70 or 80 percent of vaccination you know some countries have a, a vaccination rate of less than 10 percent of the population so you know the ASEAN country need help you know so our, our development our developed partners both in the United States and Europe and China and they also in India should extend a helping hand to us you know and they should not forget that nobody is safe until everybody is safe so, so they cannot build walls around themselves and say, we will vaccinate our own people. We don't care about the rest of the world. As we saw recently with a new variant that first emerged in Colombia, in no time at all, it has traveled to Japan. You know? So we really live in one interconnected world. Of Jaya. I, I see that. I yeah. have no, I'm nothing to add <clears throat> to what Tommy has put so succinctly. Thank you. And um, so I'll turn back to Nilifer uh, for another question from our participants. <clears throat> yes, yes, thank you. So now I think um, I'm going, there's some couple of questions very similar um, from uh, aspiring young international lawyers who are asking both Profs uh, Jayakumar and Co. Um, you know, advice, um, you know, aside from networking, attending, participating conference and participating conferences, what advice would you give to young aspiring international lawyers who want to establish their careers in international law? And, uh, and there's also a question in, uh, I don't know, how again to, to enter into that, the mafia of international advocacy, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> so let me, let me begin by saying one, work hard, write learned articles in reputable journals so people come to know about you. Secondly, be humble and seek to learn from others. So uh, apply to be an intern in ICJ, if laws, uh, PSA, uh, Apply to be an intern of Patricia and Nilufer. <laughs> learn from the learn from the, the your mentor. Third, participate constructively in international conferences, and and begin to build a reputation as someone who who knowledgeable, who is uh, a, a constructive player, and a, able to who bring value, you know, to others. Prof. Jay Kumar? Well, 
it much depends on on the country and the system of the place where the, the questioner is. Uh, and what is the questioner hoping to do? Is, is, she, is he or she going to work in the government legal service? Or is he or she planning to be in the private legal firm? So the, there are many questions. Is that private legal firm going to have an international practice? I think it will be good for if, if you aspire to have a, a role internationally in international disputes, if you're in a firm, a law firm, that in, involves itself with clients in international arbitration, in international litigation, that will give you a stepping stone. If your firm was uh, almost exclusively involved in domestic uh, legal work, then you will not have that many opportunities. Secondly, if if you are in the legal service of a country, uh, try to get into the international affairs section of your legal service. In other words, not just as a public prosecutor or draftsman, uh, it'll be an advantage for you to be in the international law, or international affairs department of your, of your legal, government's legal service. That will give you exposure to international uh, legal issues that your country may come across in its dealings with neighboring countries or with international organizations. So I think it depends on your context. And if you're fortunate to be in one of these kinds of situations, then opportunities will come by. But I do think that legal firm and that legal service is incumbent upon your bosses to also give you time and opportunity to take leave if necessary to expose to other young and upcoming lawyers in meetings, conferences, and even attend some cases in ITLOS or ICJ and observe how things are going. So these are some ideas I have. Yeah, excellent advice. Uh... Thank you so much. Um, and, and I will say just follow up, I think it is also important for, for all of us to mentor young people uh, who have been very fortunate to be in international law. So dear Patricia, the last question is yours. Thank you, Nilo, for I'm, I'm, I'm very hesitant in which one to take because we have very interesting uh, questions. I mean, from how to solve the Myanmar crisis to uh, the question of Afghanistan and what international law uh, can do about Afghanistan. But maybe I'll take a, one that is more linked to this last question about you know training, capacity building, advice, um, which is a question about the role um, that uh, the network of think tanks can play to meet new challenges uh, confronting international law. Um, so to stay a bit in the same uh, subject, and then we'll go for some cl concluding remarks. So this last question about uh, what is the role that network of think tanks can play to meet the new challenges confronting international law? Um, <clears throat> I would say the Rhodes Academy is an example where a group of um, institutions that specialize in the law of the sea have come together and hold this academy once every year in the summertime in the island of Rhodes. So that's one example. But we could have other examples of uh, like-minded think tank going to, working together to deal with some other do domain knowledge of international law. And um, the, the question on the, on, on, the, on the top of my mind now is, can we international lawyers put our brains together and think about the digital revolution which the world is going through, you know, and whether we need, you know, international laws and rules to govern cyberspace, you know. Um, so I, I would, you know, I'd like to see like-minded colleagues and think tank getting together to look at this issue, you know, um, or, or, or in, the, in the case of Afghanistan, 
I don't know how we can persuade the Taliban government to respect international law, international humanitarian law, and to respect the rights of women and girls and so on, you know. Um, Singapore had no, no, no contact with the Taliban, so, so maybe we should ask our good friends in Qatar. Qatar now occupies a unique position of being the most important interlocutor between the Taliban and the world, you know. But, but I see so many challenges um, involving Afghanistan. You know. in, in Myanmar, we have uh, appointed a special envoy and all of us in ASEAN are giving our strong support to Foreign Minister Erdogan on his uh, really important but difficult journey. Thank you. Prof Jaya, any last remarks from your side? No, I, I think I've spoken quite a lot. I'm going to do a, take a license to ask Nilifer, who is in the ILC and also chairman of the CIL, director of the CIL. Why don't we have your, your take uh, from your two different hats as to what is the role of think tanks? <laughs> you turn the table on yes, me. Yes, indeed. <laughs> All right. Well, all right. I will take the challenge then with great pleasure. I think the role of think tanks is absolutely critical um, because think tanks um, bring together people with um, knowledge, expertise, um, and it's, it's really focused on addressing specific issues. So it provides a wealth of information. And I know that uh, at least Prof Cody, you chairs, I think several think tanks in, uh, in, in, in Singapore. Um, so absolutely uh, critical because I, I believe, in, and, and Prof Jai, you can confirm this as foreign minister, I think that the reputable think tanks around the world um, uh, become an important source of information for governments. Um, mm -hmm. Think tanks can really guide and influence government policy. Um, and, but of course, we're talking about think tanks where you've got high level th thinkers, um, high level output. And, um, and so to me, for international law, um, it's important for developing import international law policy. It's important. Um, so I certainly would stress that. And again, when we're looking at future careers, that's an area as well. Uh, where aspiring international lawyers can look into working with think tanks. So that's my take on your <laughs> on this unexpected question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you. Thanks. So maybe just uh, now as concluding remarks, I mean, it's very hard to summarize this very rich um, uh, conversation that went on already for an hour and a half and time flies when you're getting all this very important and interesting insights, but I, I think we went through a number of issues uh, from contemporary challenges like climate change, cyber, digital revolution, and COVID-19. And, and it seems to me that the conclusion about the solution to these uh, challenges um, have to do with political will and courage, uh, as it was mentioned, and also an answer that has to do with multilateralism rather than um, uh, uh, other types of uh, positions. And uh, as uh, from your experience as negotiators, uh, it was very interesting to note how uh, being a small country can be a disadvantage, but can also be an advantage and how Singapore has played the key role uh, in many negotiations as a honest broker and, and, and having no hidden agenda and thus gaining the confidence of the other partners. Uh, we've also touched upon ASEAN and the important role of ASEAN as a unique uh, regional organization, different from the EU. And I've had a lot of experience with the EU and I can understand very well the remarks that were made uh, and how important it is to have a regional organization like ASEAN that is uh, very diverse, um, but it needs to keep its neutrality and its uh, unity, uh, especially in face of the increasing rivalry between China and the US that was mentioned. Um, we've also discussed issues like uh, oceans and the importance of UNCLOS and the importance to preserve UNCLOS that is going to celebrate its 40th anniversary next year um, as a constitution for the oceans. Um, 
and it was emphasized that it's not a product from the West, that it's really a, a corresponds to the aspiration of developing countries. Um, and it was a compromise between different mm -hmm. interests and, and uh, the outcome um, of a very complex um, and unique that will probably never be repeated um, diplomatic negotiation. Uh, we've also uh, spoke about third party dispute uh, resolution and how important it is uh, for states to submit um, there are difficult uh, questions that have to do with sovereignty and how difficult it is for states to take that decision. But the rule of law um, uh, really um, uh, um, is a, a key uh, aspect when one is uh, thinking of whether, um, you know, if negotiations are not uh, bringing a solution to the case, that there has to be political will also again, and a big picture approach uh, for states to uh, decide to take this um, issues uh, beyond negotiation and to third party dispute settlement. And in that regard, we also mentioned how um, in third party dispute settlement, especially before ICJ and it laws, um, the international lawyers teams are dominated <laughs> by the Anglo-Saxon uh, mafia and how um, also with the question and answer um, and part how, um, uh, you know, what tips um, uh, uh, Asian international lawyers could benefit from to uh, revert and to change this um, pattern. And uh, very lastly, on, on COVID and CIL, uh, we discussed how important it has been for CIL to be able to adapt uh, to this new reality and the advantages of the virtual world, but of course, uh, the disadvantages of not having the personal networking and uh, the future will probably be a mixed one, at least for now, um, in the future time. So this is very quickly some takeaways oh. from our discussion. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if Prof. Uh, Jai and Prof. Ko want to add something. Um, yeah. I think your, think your summation is so admirable. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, no, it's, I mean, it's difficult to summarize uh, the richness of our discussion, and I'm very grateful. I've learned a lot, definitely learned a lot from Prof. Jai and Prof. Ko today, and I'm sure our audience has also. I don't know, Nilifer, you want, if you want to give them, have the last word, word and then we'll pass oh. it to uh, Azul to close. Thank you so much, and I agree, you did a, a, a fantastic summation of a truly rich um, uh, discussion. And to be honest, I think we could go on. I feel like we've just tapped the surface of the your knowledge uh, uh, of both the Professor Ko and, and Jaya Kumar. It's been wonderful. And thank you both so much. Uh, I think you've really uh, set the right tone for the second uh, annual session of the CIL e Academy on International Law. Uh, and, and as um, director of the CIL, that is our mission. Uh, we promote international law, not just in Asia, but we are global. We are a global think tank. Um, so this is just, I think, uh, a wonderful start. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, you. thank you all the audience for Care, everyone. tuning in. Thank you. Bye. Once again, thank you for everyone for being with us. You might also like to know that CIL will be live streaming guest lectures lined up for the E Academy almost every Wednesday at 4 p.m. Singapore time from now till mid December. Look out for us on CIL Facebook page, like us, and you will be updated when the live streams begin. Lastly, thank the you. recording of today's fireside Bye. chat will be available on the CIL. Facebook page and YouTube. With that, thank you and goodbye, everyone. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.